All right, so um, we uh, talked about um, the uh, basic anatomy, right, the difference between the medial and lateral uh, tibial plateau anatomically, difference in the slope, the difference in the sort of convex versus concave shape. Uh, we talked about uh, the importance of stability, meaning preventing varus valgus instability, you know, so when the patient's in full extension, they don't have this big bony depression or, you know, uh, varus or valgus you know, of the of the tibia itself, uh, that it's healed in a position of malunion, for instance, that allows the knee to be unstable when the patient tries to stand up on it. So that's, that's what you're really trying to avoid. So unicondylar fractures are often fixed with a single plate or with screws alone. So if you have like a simple Schatzker type 1 and you have good bone, you often can fix it with isolated uh, compression screws. Just a fracture you don't see quite as often, and certainly if the bone's not that great, you may need to augment this with a with a buttress plate. It rarely needs a locking plate. Um, you know, maybe an osteoporotic bone, um, but uh, not in uh, no, normal bone. Um, you uh, um, certainly have a lot of the newer plates with uh, which are pre-contoured now and um, they don't, they can have locking screws but you certainly don't need to use them. Um, if there is a split depression, you support the depression, right? We typically use bone grafts and bone graft substitutes. We uh, use uh, rafting type screws for the subchondral bone. You know, in the old days, you still use larger fixation, 4.5 and 6.5 implants. Currently, we use 3.5 and even sometimes 2.7 or K wires uh, to provide a subchondral rafting, right? So if you have a, you know, if you have the tibial plateau, something like this, and let's just say there's a, there's a depression in this area, I mean, oftentimes your, your plate's going to sit something like this and uh, you're going to have these, uh, you know, rafting screws, small 3-5 rafting screws that come all the way across, and I'm showing it in an axial view. The idea is that um, they provide, you know, almost like you have these uh, sort of like, uh, uh, like a raft, like a wooden raft where you're lashing all these um, pieces of wood together, and they, they uh, in turn will support that depression, right? So that's the idea of rafting. You can't do rafting with two big 6.5 cannulated screws, for instance. That's just compressing the condyles. So, uh, in fact, 3.5 raft const uh, construct is uh, better than just doing a couple of 6.5 uh, screws. Um, and that's typically what we do now. K-wires can do the same kind of thing. Um, like I said, you used to use more large fragment fixation. Now you're going to see small fragment fixation pretty much used exclusively in most cases. Uh, now, and if you have a proximal tibia fracture as opposed to just a plateau fracture, something that's more metadiaphyseal, then we use the four or five uh, plates. Uh, but for just you know Schatzker one twos threes, uh, when you or fours, I mean we don't have extensive metadiaphyseal comminution. Um, and for rafting purposes, we typically are using 3.5. Now, bicondylar uh, uh, fractures are treated with uh, either dual plates or a single lateral locked plate, and sometimes a single medial locked plate. Now, when we use a single locked plate versus um, having to do two plates, um, it's a little bit tricky. We'll kind of get at this in some of the cases uh, that we'll go through uh, in trauma conference. Um, and perhaps a little bit in the book chapter, I'll show you some examples. Um, now, if you don't have locking plates, you would definitely have to do dual plates for a bicondylar fracture. Beware of the posterior medial fragment. Okay, we'll show you this. This comes up on a lot of exam questions. It obviously comes up in real life. Um, the lateral plates sometimes will not capture this. And biomechanically, it's often better to just have something buttressing that directly rather than sort of hanging it, so to speak, on... Uh, locking screws coming from the other side of the tibia. Okay, tuberosity vulsions should be fixed directly if uh, if needed. So like I said, beware of that posterior medial fragment. Don't miss it. Identify it. Reduce it. Stabilize it. Here's an example of a, um, actually this is just a lateral uh, split depressed tibial plateau fracture um, treated with um, 
a la single lateral locked plate. You can see it's a non-locked plate. They've done a nice job getting the articular reduction and overall the uh, condylar widening has uh, been improved. Here you can see perhaps there was a little bit of excessive uh, widening there and here you can see that's uh, probably a little bit back to normal. Now here's an example of the Schatzker 4 and the medial plateau fracture, right? So you have almost a fracture dislocation type injury here where the uh, lateral um, femur is all the way out here and uh, perhaps um, you even may have ligament disruption on the, on the lateral side here. Uh, there's no way you're going to treat this with just lateral fixation. This requires you to come all the way over to the medial side, kind of like it's shown here, and fix this with a medial with a medial plate. Um, another example, fracture dislocation here. You can imagine most likely those you know lateral collateral ligaments coming all the way here are probably disrupted, um, and in fact uh, there may be some. Uh, iliotibial band avulsion here. You can see it's fixed on the medial side. PCLs uh, repaired um, off a of fracture, etc. So um, that injury, neurovascular compromise, and these potential and these uh, patients are uh, is a potential problem. Um, so you need to get these out to length, reduced right away. Check that for vascular injury, neurologic injury, and uh, be prepared for ligament injury and in patients who might need to get an MRI on. So surgical controversies, well, they revolve around to some degree the type of bone graft used, um, whether you should use autografts, allografts, cement type materials like hydroxyapatites and calcium sulfates. I mean, tricalcium sulfates have been shown to work pretty well here, good compressive strength. X-fixes, um, you know, certainly for temporary use and higher grade tibial plateau fractures can be helpful. Arthroscopy is a bit of a controversy. You know, I, I think that in general, the um, this is good for the uh, type three, right? So if you have a pure depression and there's no split and you don't need to plate it, but you may not see that depression really well if you open it. Well, that's not a bad one to do arthroscopy, and then you do uh, sort of you tamp up, um, you make a, a separate you know, incision and you sort of tamp up and then observe the reduction under under uh, uh, arthroscopy and then you can bone graft underneath it, put screws, whatever. But usually no plate needed. It's just that it gets to be, you know, you imagine you have C-arm there, you have, you know, uh, all your arthroscopy equipment there, uh, it just gets to be a bit of a production. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, things don't go so efficiently that way. And, of course, another controversy is the use of locked plate technology. Uh, clearly, for osteoporosis, bicondylar fractures uh, can be very helpful. Uh, unicondylar fractures, not so much. So a few words about bone grafts. Like I said, calcium phosphate cements can do really well. In general, I think most people would agree you need something. Uh, there are surgeons who will leave a void there and just rely on the rafting. But I think most surgeons feel comfortable having some type of structural support under a depression once they reduce it. Um, I talked about a lot about spanning external, external fixation. Well, what about ring fixators? You know, like Ilazarov type uh, techniques or so-called you know, hybrid fixators, but some type of circular fixation. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly an option. And um, this is a uh, study looking at uh, circular fixation um, for tibial plateau fractures and um, you know certainly it is a um, it is an option it can have less uh, uh, complications in deep infection um, it can be done uh, you know it's a familiar technique so uh, it's something to keep in mind I think certainly uh, and I think what you see is a lot of surgeons certainly like myself tend to use it for patients with really really bad soft tissues know, bad wounds, maybe blisters, diabetic, or I don't know, a patient who you think is going to potentially be much worse off or have a bad complication if you do plating. So you're kind of selecting a group of patients that's going to do poorly to begin with. So I think that's why, you know, we often see, um, you know, sometimes problems when we're using external fixatives because we use them on the worst patients. Um, but it clearly has a role. Talked about arthroscopy, Schatzker 3, I think, is the best uh, scenario uh, to consider it. Definitely worry about extravasation, right? So uh, compartment syndrome is a reported uh, 
complication. So if you ever do arthroscopy, keep the pump low or just use gravity flow. Uh, keep, in, you know, keep the lights on in the room. Keep your hand on the th uh, thigh and the lower leg. Check it every now and then. Make sure you're not extravasating and you, know, you don't uh, get so, so focused and wrapped up on the, getting the depression reduced and you spend a lot of time and an hour later you realize you got a compartment syndrome and didn't even realize. Cause... Okay, lock plate, we talked about this. Uh, here's a case. Um, I think you can see why it failed, right? Not reduced, not compressed, no rafting screws, no articular reduction or support, right? Uh, here's a case of uh, polytrauma with a, you know, tibial plateau fracture looks by condylar a uh, lot of uh, condylar widening here you can see here compared to here and over here a uh, big posterior uh, I think believe that's a posterior medial piece there treated with a spanning external fixator uh, here's your uh, CT scan presumably in the X fix so multiple fragments here um, here you can see uh, that's a posterior medial piece, so you can kind of see these are the posterior condyles here, so that's a posterior medial fragment. There it is there. Looks like they uh, treated this with some interfrag screws, lag screws, uh, lateral uh, plate. Um, so here's the post reduction x-rays. I want you to sort of like look at that and sort of think to yourself, uh, does that look okay? Would you buy it? Is there a problem? And uh, in fact, I think you should recognize that there is a little bit of a problem here, right? So that is fixed in some varus. Uh, it was initially fixed in varus. Uh, perhaps the patient was non-compliant also, and you can chalk that up perhaps. But it, it really was fixed in some varus to begin with, and you really only had the lateral locked plate there. So if you start off trying to keep it in varus, and then you don't have any medial support there, then you got a problem. Okay, so this was addressed by taking this out. Distractor on the uh, on the uh, medial side, getting this uh, out to length. Um, here you can see um, the uh, plate deformity there. And uh, with uh, appropriate realignment, um, and then using the uh, pl a plate on the medial side for direct medial fixation, you can see that this can get aligned and uh, then now this can go on to heal uh, with a satisfactory clinical result. So you you potentially will have problems with osteoporosis, with your fixation, certainly with infection, especially in the higher uh, grade uh, fracture types, increased age. Thou shalt not varus, right? So varus is always going to be a problem um, uh, with uh, you know meniscectomies and with uh, val valgus instability greater than 10 degrees. Uh, and varus instability is a problem as well, right? So varus tilter instability and valgus instability. And the valgus is more common because the lateral plateau fractures are the more common types, which usually lead to valgus. So bottom line, well, um, you can often non-opt these for minimal in articular incongruity. Five millimeters, I would say, is a bit, you know, generous. I mean, many of us will, you know, not really accept something below or more than two millimeters, but um, but again, I, I did mention in the last set of slides, the tibia plateau is a is a place where there is a little bit of tolerance to articular incongruity. It's it's instability and you know malreduction that creates knee instability and varus and things like that. That's what gets you into trouble, right? So if you have that, but if the knee is stable in full extension, normous nor and normal varus valgus alignment, you often are going to be okay. Um, whereas, um, um, right, you're going to be okay. Whereas, if you have significant uh, articular displacement, you have instability, uh, and again, we don't really, I don't ask you to check stability for these, you know, obviously displaced, angulated, unstable tibial plateau fractures. This is really for the ones where you're not sure. It's a mild split, mild split depression. Um, it looks like maybe it'll be okay, but you're not sure. Well, that's the one you have to check and make sure that they don't have instability, which presumably could be addressed by addressing the bony uh, problem. Um, all right, so um, we're going to end it there, and uh, we'll go over some of the uh, textbook uh, uh, key points in the next slides. Thanks.